Mars by Gustav Holst from the planets is big, bold and blockbuster music. It sets the heart pounding, but also brings back personal memories of the first time I heard it on a record bought by my dad. By contrast, the lyrical and transcendent Fantasia on a Theme by Thomas Tallis, the work of Ray Fawn Williams. This is music that simply reduces me to tears. The creators of this extraordinary music were the closest of friends over four decades. But there was more to it than this, because they were also collaborators on a project to revive English music. In late Victorian England, there was a feeling that the country was in the musical doldrums after what Holst called a long period of darkness. And that compared to Germany, England was a place of musical second raters. No music of native genius had been produced since composers like Thomas Tallis in the 16th century and Henry Purcell in the 17th. Perhaps these old masters held the key to a revival. I dreamt I drove my and all over England, there was a music just waiting to be discovered. Folk. Could this also be the inspiration the young composers needed to create a new music for a new century? There was an urgency to this, because industrialization and the growth of cities was threatening to destroy the rural way of life that created folk music. And after the industrialized fighting of the First World War left behind such misery and loss, Audiences looked to the music of Holst and Vaughan Williams to try and make sense of it all. So how would these friends fulfil their dreams of making a national music again? I'm Amanda Vickery and to find out I'm going on a journey through England in search of the life and work of Gustav Holst. I'm Tom Service and I'm setting out to do the same for Rafe Vaughan Williams. Together, we celebrate the remarkable friendship that changed English music forever. Gustav Holst and Rafe Vaughan Williams first met in the hubbub of London, Britain's imperial metropolis, when they began autumn term 1895 at the Royal College of Music. To save money, Holst had walked the near 100 miles from his hometown of Cheltenham. Vaughan Williams had come from digs in South London. Rafe was 23, Gustav two years younger. They were starting their musical careers the same year that a new festival, the Proms, began in a new venue, the Queen's Hall. But aside from a composer like Elgar, where was the homegrown music of real quality to be played here? It was for this reason that the Royal College had recently been founded to improve the standards of music making and raise the profile and reputation of English music. Here was an institution under royal patronage dedicated to creating music as polished and accomplished as the goods being manufactured and exported around the world. When Vaughan Williams and Holst began their musical careers, they were living in what one German critic called Das Land ohne Musik, the land without music. The repertoire in concert halls across the country was predominantly German, and the young students themselves were enthralled to Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, and they were passionate fans of Wagner in particular. And yet, one of their teachers here was the English composer Hubert Parry, the composer of Jerusalem, no less. 
and he urged his students in the strongest possible terms to write music that befits an Englishman and a Democrat. Let other folk make money From the beginning, Gustav and Rafe were heart and soul dedicated to Parry's cause, yet they were very different in temperament and in background. Vaughan Williams grew up here at Leith Hill Place in some comfort. His father had died when Rafe was two and a half, and he arrived here with his mother, brother and sister to live a life among the social elite of Surrey. There was always enough money. His mother was a Wedgwood, the family who had made their fortune during the Industrial Revolution making pottery. On his father's side were wealthy lawyers and churchmen. With inheritances from rents, stocks and shares, Rafe knew that he would never really have to work for a living. He once wryly admitted to having been born with a small silver spoon in my mouth. He had a conventional education for a young boy of the upper classes, but music was also an important part of life in a country house like this. So from the age of six, he had music lessons. He learnt the piano and he learnt the violin. And at school, at Charterhouse, he even had his first serious piece performed. But Rafe was no boy genius like Mozart. In fact, his family doubted his talent and even disapproved of his choice of career. But he stuck with it. He had an absolute inner certainty that music had to be his life. Holst grew up in very different circumstances. He was born here at 4 Pitville Terrace, Cheltenham, on 21st of September 1874, into a family of professional musicians and teachers. The von Holst had come to England a century earlier from Riga in Latvia, and in this terraced house Gustav spent his early years. It's now a museum full of all kinds of memorabilia that bring alive his story. This is Gustav's dad, Adolphus von Holst. In fact, he added that von to give a bit of Germanic aristocratic cachet to the struggling family business. He had to borrow the hundred pounds to send his son to the Royal College of Music. And here's the lad himself. He's a very bonny boy. But he was, in fact, quite a sickly child. He had what was always known as a weak chest. He was asthmatic. I've got modern medicines to relieve my asthma, but to expand his chest and improve his breathing, Gustav learned the trombone. Besides his asthma, Gustav also developed a condition called neuritis in his right hand. He said it made his hand feel like a jelly, overcharged with electricity. He had no choice but to ask his friends to copy out his scores for him and to conduct with his left hand. And on top of all of this, he was very, very short-sighted. Yet from the beginning, Hulse never allowed his physical handicaps to hinder his enjoyment of the countryside. He would think nothing of walking miles into the Cotswolds when, as a teenager, performing at local halls and churches as conductor, choirmaster and organist, Gustav immersed himself in the choral and orchestral experience. And this habit of long walks never left him. Into a cherished landscape like this, 
Holst invited Vaughan Williams to join him. Hello, you. Here were the little and large of early 20th century English music and such an attraction of opposites. Vaughan Williams was tall and shambling, the more extrovert of the two, whose body would shake with laughter, prone to outbursts of bad temper, which subsided as quickly as they erupted. By contrast, the five foot six host, quieter and reserved. Yet it was he who was always the more adventurous and offbeat. Here was somebody who learned Sanskrit to better understand the mysteries of the world and give mystical meaning to his music. These walks together became what they called their field trips, where they would good-heartedly and passionately talk about music and chew the fat. You get a fantastic feel for what their friendship was like. Vaughan Williams talks about it in his autobiography later, and he says, I think that Gustav showed all that he wrote to me, and I nearly all I wrote to him. I say nearly all advisedly, Rafe writes, fantastic this, because sometimes I could not face the absolute integrity of his vision, and I hid some of my worst crimes from him. That is a great phrase, isn't it? In integrity of vision. I think that gives a strong sense of their relationship and what it was that Holst gave the much more confident and exuberant Rafe Vaughan Williams, that kind of clarity of purpose, that absolute integrity. But I think the other thing, though, quite practically, that um, Holst brought to the table was the fact that he had much greater experience of musicians. After all, he had to earn a crust after college. He played his trombone, didn't he, at the, at the seaside. So he knew orchestration inside and out. Yeah. You know, if there's one thing I reckon they must have been most fired up by on these walks, it was the state of English music and what they were going to do to, to change it, to make it better. And one of the answers they started to find was in the villages that they visited and the folk songs that were sung there. One piece of new technology that made musical exploration possible was the bicycle. Rafe first got on his bike in 1903, setting out to discover the rich rural culture of Edwardian England. Vaughan Williams went into the field like this after meeting Cecil Sharp. Sharp was co-founder of the Folk Song Society, created in 1898 to save the music of the countryside. In the villages, younger generations had become uninterested in learning the old songs and looked to towns and cities now accessible by the railway for the ready-made entertainment of the music halls. So Rafe was a man on a mission. One place where he struck gold was Rusper in Surrey. In this pub, the plough, he met a Mr Garman who sang for him a number of local songs. And Vaughan Williams used another remarkable recent invention, the wax cylinder recorder, to preserve them. Here, in, yes. in, in 1903. This, this is, machine is from around that, is almost it, exactly that time. Of the yeah. I've come to meet local singer Martin Wyndham Reed and sound engineer Duncan Smith to record one of those, The Ploughboy's Dream. I am a ploughboy stout and strong as ever drove a team. And three years since I lay in bed, I had a dreadful dream. But now the dream has done me good, I put it down in rhyme. 
that other boys may sing and learn whenever they have time. So let's finish recording. Once the recording is done, amazingly, there can be instant playback. So they could have heard this back. Yes, straight yeah. away, yes. Gosh. Yes. For Vaughan Williams, the discovery of a song like the Ploughboy's Dream was a eureka moment. It's amazingly clear. Yes. It's unbelievable, yeah. the, the yeah. quality of, of, of reproduction. I mean, Rafe agreed with Cecil Sharp when Sharp argued that this music was transparently pure and truthful, simple and direct in its utterance. You can rewind it or... Yeah, yeah. wow. We can play yeah, any fantastic. bits of it. The other thing is, with these machines, you can pick... So if you're transcribing it, yeah. if you're trying to take the music and you've missed a, missed a bit, you, just, you can just play... Oh, God. It's, it's so sophisticated. Yes. Yeah. During the time Vaughan Williams was collecting near on 800 songs in a decade, he introduced Holst to Sharp. So Gustav became fascinated by folk music too. For both of them, folk was a welcome escape from the long shadow of German music. And it was an older musical language in folk, that of modes, which was particularly liberating. To understand its importance... I meet up with composer and pianist David Owen Norris. A mode is a selection of notes that you're going to write a tune with. A lot of early folk melodies only use five notes. And there's a lot of lovely tunes written with just five notes like that. And borrowing from the Greek, we call that pentatonic. Or the ancient modes might have seven notes, but they wouldn't be the seven that we necessarily expect. For example, might be the selection of notes. But Germanic music, which they're trying to escape, what sort of mode is that existing in? Germanic music had been developed, and indeed all the music of the 18th and 19th century, but especially Germanic music, had been using semitones a lot. The major scale, for example, always ends with that closing semitone, one note next to each other. And even the minor scale, the same thing. And the semitone became so important that eventually in the music of Wagner in Germany, it's all semitones. The famous opening of his opera, Tristan and Isolde, is semitones. And it's this sort of exploitation, this tyranny of the semitone that Holst and Vaughan Williams are trying to escape. And the ancient modes that they found in folk music, remembered in the countryside by these old singers, uh, the, the modes gave them the freedom from this, what we call the leading note, because instead of going as the clinching aspect of something, modes have a set of different relationships between the notes. Using these folk modes, Hulse began an orchestral work based on four songs found by Cecil Sharp in Somerset. First, in this Somerset Rhapsody, is the melody from a sheep shearing song called It's a Rosebud in June. Hulse begins by presenting the tune more or less unadorned. And I love the fact that Holst says, wherever possible, this tune should be played on an oboe d'amore. Mm -hmm. So he didn't just want an ordinary mm -hmm. oboe, he wanted a, a slightly longer oboe that were very rare in Holst's day to make that slightly different, more plangent sound that would make the audience listen at the very beginning and think, oh, this is something very new.
The Somerset Rhapsody was Hull's first real success and quickly became a favourite in the repertoire. When it was played at the Queen's Hall, in front of the Queen herself, the Daily Telegraph raved that Holst had a master's grasp of the orchestra, as of composition, and a command of colour without detriment to his knowledge of form. As folk began to create a more English music played in concert halls, Vaughan Williams also turned his attention to the music sung in churches. For centuries, the church had been the most important sponsor and promoter of choral music making. The nation sung on Sundays, so here was a captive audience to test out ideas for a national music. His chance to put this into action came in 1904 when Percy Dearmer, Vicar of St Mary's Primrose Hill in London, asked Rafe to work with him on a new English hymnal. For this, he discovered tunes that were simply more fun to sing than those laboured over by congregations reading from the Victorian hymns Ancient and Modern. Remember this one? It's the song we recorded in the pub. Vaughan Williams turned the melody, The Ploughboy's Dream, into a Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Here it's sung by the choir from St Mary's, conducted by Tony Haywood. Rafe also wrote a few tunes of my own. One is still a firm favourite, Sine Domine, for all the saints. new about it is that um, it's got um, a really important bass line, it's got this marching bass that keeps going, giving it sort of an inner rhythmical energy and that's quite unusual. Um, I think the other thing is that it starts high and comes down low. Most tunes start low and go up high, but this one goes the other way around. And then Vaughan Williams did, um, arranged some of the verses for unison singing and then some for the choir. So meaning, I mean, the idea of the unison singing thing would be that the congregation, uh, everyone could sing, you know, the, the melody, the that tune. great tune that you hear once and you kind of goes into you and then you remember it, whilst it's then harmonised by the choir or, or by the organ in the church. Absolutely. <laughs> And it's set in a nice part of the voice. It's moving mainly by step, so there aren't too many different leaps uh, to uh, navigate. Uh, but as well as that, he's keeping an eye on the choir, keeping the choir engaged, so they've got plenty to do as well. So he's sort of appeasing the congregation and the choir. <laughs> Although Vaughan Williams called himself a cheerful agnostic, he believed in the communality of people singing. He wanted people to join together to sing, and he really believed in the power of that. And I think we can see something like that really clearly in a hymn like For All the Saints. By 1901, Gustav had fallen in love and wanted to marry and start a family. The hand-to-mouth existence of playing the trombone in theatre orchestras and seaside bands had to end. So during the day, he began teaching at St Paul's Girls' School in West London. Theory, composition, singing and conducting the orchestra. 
Holst was affectionately nicknamed Gussie by the girls. In the evenings, he worked at Morley Memorial College for working men and women, a place one student described as a sort of heaven we go to on Mondays and Wednesdays. Despite busy lives, the two friends still met up for field trips where their discussion continued about what must be done to protect the culture of a green and pleasant land under threat from the forces of modernity. I think Holst and Vaughan Williams are really driven by a search for a lost Eden, and perhaps an Eden that really never existed. And they're searching not in the city, but in the deep countryside. And of course, not in the present, but in this idyllic pre-industrial past. You have poets like A. E. Houseman, author of A Shropshire Lad, and that captures an aching sense of melancholy about a vanished rural England. And that chimes with rural preservation societies that are going about trying to protect ancient hedgerows and landscapes and old churches. And then that has its artistic expression in the arts and crafts movement founded by William Morris, which attempts to recapture craft-based, non-industrial modes of production so that people can have lovely things made by hand. Vaughan Williams fashioned a lovely thing of his own when in 1910 he accepted a commission from the Three Choirs Festival held that year in Gloucester Cathedral. With his composition for this magnificent Gothic space, Ray found his true voice. And he did so by going back in time, excavating the past to create something new. I'm here to listen to the lay clerks of the cathedral sing the third mode melody composed around 1567 by Thomas Tallis. This third mode used by Tallis is called the Phrygian with origins yet further back in ancient Greece. Rafe found this gem during his research for the English hymnal. This haunting melody became the foundation for the Fantasia on a theme by Thomas Tallis. Standing here, it's a viscerally moving experience. The strings creating a sound that conjures up a yearning for a world that seems to be disappearing. Hannah Kendall is one of the leading composers of her generation. For Hannah, playing the Fantasia when she was in her youth orchestra was a truly transformative experience. I just remember sitting in the middle of this incredible string orchestra and it's almost as though you have the space to listen to what um, the other ensembles are doing. So I was playing in the, in the main orchestra and then to hear how he carries the, the tunes and the themes throughout all of the other ensembles. So it's incredibly enjoyable to play as well as listen to as an audience member. You know, all 
of the inspirations that he has have obviously come from a place truly resonant with him as a composer. And so I think as a performer, that is something that is always something that will speak to someone um, because it's the authenticity of, of the notes and the reasons be behind why he's put them in the places that he has done. I love this section because it is a great example of all of the lines interweaving together. So it starts off with the viola, which is one of my favourite instruments. Just the, the mellowness of the melodic line that comes through here. And then it's joined in by the violin and then all of the other instruments. It's great how it emulates a vocal line, I think, of that time that um, is something that he was trying to do. I actually ended up training as a singer, and so this section um, just reminds me of all of those times of singing those great polyphonic works. Critical opinion about the Fantasia was divided after its premiere in Gloucester Cathedral on the night of the 6th of September 1910. One called it a queer mad work by an odd fellow. Another wrote that throughout its course, one is never sure whether one is listening to something very old or very new. I think that's perceptive, because what the Fantasia does is collapse historical time as well as opening up a new musical space. Vaughan Williams said that all great music should have sincerity, simplicity and serenity. The Fantasia proves all three. As well as the field trips with Vaughan Williams, Holst walked on his own. The roots of his solitary rambling working like song lines of inspiration for him. I think walking always sets me thinking of new tunes, he said. And Gustav loved the happenstance of wandering. In 1913, Holst got off the train at Colchester and started heading west. Chancing upon the picturesque Essex town of Thaxted, with its peace and charm, here was the rural Eden Gustav had been looking for. But 1913 and 1914 were hardly good times for someone with the name of Von Holst to be scouring the English countryside. Leading up to and after the outbreak of the First World War, fears of German rearmament and world domination by the Kaiserreich led newspapers to stoke up anti-German feelings with lurid stories of espionage. So rumours began to circulate that this German hymn writer must be a spy. Two vigilant ladies from a nearby village reported him to the police. Happily cleared of treachery, Holst was accepted by locals as our Mr. Von, and he threw himself into the counterculture that the local vicar was intent on creating here. The Reverend Conrad Noel was part priest, part provocateur. Noel made sure the red flag was flown on May Day and daringly encouraged secular music making inside his church and supported pagan folk dancing outside it. 
Here Holst began his most famous work, The Planet Suite, prompted by the latest of his otherworldly preoccupations. It was here in alternative Thaxted that Holst became intrigued by astrology. It appealed to his mystical side. This was a time when Albert Einstein was investigating the universe in his theory of relativity. A universe conjured up by H.G. Wells as a place of awe and terror. So during a time of intense interest in stars, science and science fiction, most of the planet suite was written here at St. Paul's Girls' School. Mr. Holst worked in a soundproofed practice room on seven mood pictures, each named after a different planet and its astrological character. This may sound like... Film and TV composer Debbie Wiseman shows me how skillfully Holst uses the orchestra in Mars, the bringer of war. We start with these pedal notes, an ostinato rhythm, which is one that repeats itself. Ostinato? Yes, ostinato, it repeats itself over and over again. Mm -hmm. And Holst was a big fan of doing this. So you hear this. And it's in 5-4, not the usual 4-4. Four, four. So it's five beats in a bar. Two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Which why is that significant? Well, it sort of immediately sets you off course. We're used to except four in a bar. Suddenly, when you go into five, it gives it a feeling of edginess. The brilliant thing about Holst is the way he writes, you can very rarely disassociate the actual musical material from the orchestration because it's so beautifully and seamlessly put together. So in the opening, we have this ostinato, this repeated rhythm on two harps, strings which are instructed to play with the wood of the bow, which is really chilling, gives it a really cold effect. And the timpani, which are instructed to play with wooden sticks, which have a harder quality than, say, soft sticks. So immediately, you get this much more menacing, hypnotic sound. And he was a very shy, mild-mannered man, and yet here he is writing this extrovert music. And to start a piece like that with such confidence, with such bravado. He writes a tune for a tenor tuba. Now, tenor tubas don't often get centre stage in an orchestra, but because Holst was a trombonist, and he, he learnt his skill in orchestration by being in an orchestra, playing in the brass section, sitting in theatre pits. And so he wrote exceptionally well for the brass, and he would allow the brass to have their moments to shine. Because often, you know, when you're writing for a brass instrument, you might just use them in the big climaxes, mm -hmm. they're there to add power but he would take something like a tenor tuba and create a melody for it, and it has quite a military feel. And then the trumpets answer this little phrase with, again, a very characteristic trumpet tune. The orchestra consists of a mighty 84 players to create this wall of sound. You can feel almost overwhelmed. Holst began Mars in the months before the outbreak of war. I hear imminent catastrophe in the music, an ominous warning of what is to come. If Mars was a prophecy of war, it was a tale foretold. As lights went out and great empires began to crumble, terrible and relentless sacrifice began on the battlefield. 
This was a conflict where all the civilized values that underpinned the great cultures of Europe were shelled to smithereens. Holst tried to enlist, but with his neuritis and bad eyesight, he was rejected for active service. In the summer of 1914, Vaughan Williams had just completed his heart-stoppingly beautiful A Lark Ascending. This music for solo violin and orchestra is as tender as Mars is violent. Rafe spent his war years away from England, and it was his war experiences and the landscape of northern France that inspired a work of musical revelation. In the summer of 1916, he was stationed in Ecoivre, close to fighting on the Vimy Ridge. The area around the village then and now is dominated by the towers of the Abbey de mont saint eloi first reduced to ruin during the French Revolution and further battered by German shelling. Rafe had not thought twice about doing his patriotic duty and he signed up as soon as war was declared, despite being 41. Private Vaughan Williams served King and Country as a wagon orderly with the 2nd 4th London Field Ambulance. With this unit, he was on the Western Front during the six months of the bloody Somme campaign. Along a track like this, Vaughan Williams helped to evacuate the wounded from the trenches to the advanced dressing stations further back. As he wrote to Holst, I go to the front line every day. Now this could be dangerous and difficult work. Under fire, he accompanied motor ambulances who, nearer the fighting, had to negotiate shell holes and the debris of war. Rafe was a witness to the horror of it all. The first ideas for his third symphony, the pastoral, began to form during the evenings when, to find peace of mind, he would walk up the hill near his French billet to wait for the setting of the sun. I can feel why Vaughan Williams loved this place so much. Later in his life, he compared this kind of atmosphere to the melancholy sunsets of the great French landscape painter Corot. You can see why. This is transcendent, otherworldly. Vaughan Williams never spoke about his feelings about the war. He didn't need to, because its essence is expressed here in the pastoral, his war requiem. The first performance of the Third Symphony took place on the 26th of January 1922 in the Queen's Hall. Everybody in that audience would have lost family or friends in the recent catastrophe. When Gustav Holst heard it, he wrote to his friend, It is the very essence of you, which is one of the two reasons, the other being that it is a beautiful work of art. why it is such an important event in my life. In the pastoral, Vaughan Williams reaches visionary heights, taking the symphonic form so dominated by the Germans and making it emphatically and successfully English, his own. All the ingredients are present, folk, modes and the influence of centuries-old music. But in his modern synthesis, the range of emotions expressed has expanded from the joyful to the mournful. It's a real achievement in English music that others would follow. 
I feel a cathartic serenity here, but also the pain that this music memorializes just there under the surface. The fourth and last movement in particular is breathtaking. At the end of it, there's a single soprano voice, a wordless lament for the near million dead, wounded and missing from the Great War. The piece, the field trips of Gustav and Rafe resumed with the usual vigour. In September 1921, they met up to walk and talk in the Malvern Hills. And with them was Hull's friend, William Whittaker, who took along his camera. So we have photographs of the two together, as ever, enjoying each other's company. They were now middle-aged. Their music was played in concert halls, to receptive audiences all over the country, where after the trauma of war, people looked again to the civilizing force of music. And by now, they were almost establishment. But despite this, they remained as committed as ever to their youthful ideals to transform English music. The experience of war and the democratization that came with it only reinforced their beliefs. Vaughan Williams was still vehement. If the roots of your art are firmly planted in your own soil, and that soil has anything to give you, you may still gain the whole world and not lose your own. So Gustav's life changed at all then? No, fundamentally not, because he still was teaching, lecturing, and remain the moving force behind the Thaxter Festival, bringing together private school girls and workers from Morley College to make music together. That's similar for Rafe, because he's still involved with the Leith Hill Festival near his home. Actually, I'm proud to say that my great-grandmother was one of the Leith Hill singers. She sang for Rafe Vaughan Williams in the early 1950s. But it's that sense of, you know, what these festivals are now. I think we take them for granted a bit now, but these two friends are, are absolutely pioneers in this idea of communal music making for the people. So is that what Vaughan Williams means by the term musical citizenship? I think absolutely. I think it's about giving everyone their voice. It's a, a musical democracy through sound. In April 1922, Hulse travelled to Dorset to meet a writer whose evocations of rural life he had always read with pleasure, Thomas Hardy. Gustav arrived at Hardy's grand home of Maxgate, a little bedraggled from his journey. Wearing a battered old Panama hat and carrying an equally battered old music case, Holst was confronted by Hardy's second wife, Florence, who insisted, oh no, Mr. Hardy never sees photographers. Unabashed, he fished out an actual invitation and was promptly let in to revel in the opportunity to meet and talk with his literary hero. He was delighted to find out that Hardy had heard the planets 
not live, but by listening to a recording of it on another piece of technology that democratised music. So it occurs to me sitting here just how important, revolutionary even, the invention of this machine must have been. Think of all the people who heard the planets or Fantasia on a record player. People who would never have dreamt of setting foot in a concert hall. So think how important the gramophone was to the transmission of a national music. And soon there was another extraordinary revolution in sound. This is London Court. In the year that Holst met Hardy, the BBC began radio transmissions. The Planets was one of the first pieces of music to be heard on the airwaves when it was broadcast in early 1924, now giving the suite nationwide exposure. Paradoxically, however, these post-war years were a difficult time for Holst. Heard in the concert hall, on disc and on the radio, the planets made him famous. But Gustav was deeply uneasy with his celebrity and was never able or willing to repeat its success. Critics began to either dismiss or patronise his gifts as a composer. Holst, very close to having a nervous breakdown, was ordered to rest. But in 1925, Gustav returned to Dorset and walked the landscape described in Thomas Hardy's novel, The Return of the Native. It was at present a place perfectly accordant with man's nature, neither ghastly, hateful, nor ugly, neither commonplace, unmeaning, nor tame, but like a man, slighted and enduring, and withal singularly colossal and mysterious in its swarthy monotony. Rereading Hardy and being in nature consoled Holst and renewed his sense of purpose. And he now wrote what he considered his best ever work, named after Hardy's Wessex wilderness, Egdon Heath. Holst himself was wielding the conductor's baton at the premiere of Egdon Heath on the 13th of February 1928 in Cheltenham. Thomas Hardy had died only two weeks before, so Holst dedicated the score to his memory. This sounded so modern, austere, dissonant and disturbing. Even Vaughan Williams had to carefully consider his own feelings before eventually writing to Holst, I've come to the conclusion that Egdon Heath is beautiful. Bless you, therefore. Music feels like a very different coming to terms with shattered landscapes after warfare than that of Vaughan Williams in the pastoral, but I do feel the same attempt to find new explanations and consolations. I find it haunting, but also curiously redemptive and healing, leading us to a new place of peace, perhaps. In August 1932, Holst made a last sentimental journey back to the Cotswolds. He started his walk in the village of Wick Rissington, where at 17 he had been organist and choirmaster 
for the parish church of St. Lawrence. A plaque proudly records the fact. Yet Hulse's always fragile health was now beginning to fail him. He admitted that when trying to compose, he just fell asleep, and this brought his spirits down low once again. But in one truly touching letter from Gustav to Rafe, he wrote, as soon as I reached the bottom, I had one clear, intense and calm feeling, that of overwhelming gratitude. And the four chief reasons for gratitude were music, the Cotswolds, Rafe Vaughan Williams, and having known the impersonality of orchestral playing. It's such an unusual term, the impersonality of orchestral playing, but it sums up Holt's entire philosophy, that of letting go of the ego, merging happily with the collective, the sheer musical democracy of it all. This is the truth sent from above. Just before Christmas 1932, there was a last and poignant collaboration between the two friends in the grand hall of St Paul's Girls' School. Gustav decided to dust off his trombone for a performance of Rave's Fantasia on Christmas carols. But in the following years, his health deteriorated further. On the 23rd of May, 1934, he had surgery for a duodenal ulcer, but died two days later of heart failure, short of his 60th birthday. Vaughan Williams wrote to Hulse's wife and daughter, My only thought is now, whichever way I turn, what are we to do without him? When Rafe died, 24 years later, two framed photographs were found in his bedroom. One was of Gustav. I'm in no doubt that these two friends were vital to a renaissance in English music that filled concert halls with homegrown music of excellence, who I'm proud to say put Britain back on the musical map and paved the way for future generations of composers to thrive. And for me, their music unlocks feelings of wonderment at the natural world, of the melancholy of the passage of time, of love, and of loss. Well, surely all of this confirms just how indebted we all are to this beautiful friendship.